we will go from there. So we're talking about uh, the flood, and we got halfway through. I always think I can get finished and can't. So I want to just read a handful of scriptures again. We went over these last week, but I want to do them again. Some of the main scriptures, I'm not going to read all three chapters, but the Bible says, well, that page stood in the wrong place. There we go. It says, the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. And I'm going to skip around a little bit just to give you the overview. But it says, so the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land. Man and animals and creeping things and the birds of the heavens. For I am sorry that I've made them. That's pretty significant. When you look at the Hebrew word for blot out, it means to erase, to obliterate. I will erase everything I did. He said, I'm, I'm, I wish I never even made them. That's what God said. Now, God knew in advance what would happen. But let me, let me try to put this into some, some perspective that's not even close. No one, none of you in here who have children regret that you had children. There are probably days you're like, what in the world? <laughs> what in the world? That's a horrible, horrible way to even say that. But I'm just trying to find some way to make that make sense. I guess for a woman when she's laying in the hospital screaming, she you know, blames her husband. And, you know, then they're in there. I'm, you know I'm joking. But you get the idea. That's an awful analogy. But I, I can't think of any better way to say it. But God knew they would fail. But he was like, you know, I'm sorry that it, I made them. Because it said it grieved him to his heart. It grieved them to see what had happened. So the Lord said, I'll blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land. And the man and the animals, the creeping things, the birds of the heaven. And going on it says, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. Verse 13, chapter 6, he says that God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for all the earth is filled with violence. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. I said last week we think things are bad, but everything was violent. Only Noah was found righteous. Only Noah we assume his family was righteous, but the Bible doesn't say they were. It says he was righteous, and God spared him and his family. Thank you. And that was it. Everyone else was evil. So God said, Behold, I'll bring a flood of waters on the earth to destroy all flesh in which the breath of life is under in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything, everything that is on the earth shall die. Of the birds. And of course he took two of each kind. And then he tells Noah. In chapter 7, he says, In seven days I'll send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and every living thing I've made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And then verse 11 says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, very specifically, he says, On that day all of the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. We'll talk more about that tonight. Don't think it just rained. It did rain. But there's significance to the fountains of the deep and the gates of heaven, the windows of heaven. That is significant. And I want to look at that tonight. And then they enter the ark, and the Bible says, The Lord shut him in. The waters prevailed above the highest mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. And everything died. Everything on the dry land, in whose nostrils was the breath of life, died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. Man and animals, creeping things, birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. The Bible says the waters prevailed on the earth for 150 days. And then afterwards the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were closed and the rain from the heavens was restrained. We know that was after the 40 days. The rain was sustained or ended after 40 days. They get off the ark and he says, never again, I'll never do this again. I'll never strike down every living creature as I've done. And I'm not going to repeat everything I said last week, but all the, the doomsday scenarios of global warming, that the ice caps are going to melt, we're all going to be underwater, that is, and that is not scriptural. That is just flat out rebellion against the word of God. That is not going to happen. We are not going to flood again. I can't promise there won't be some coastal flooding here and there. Well, there will be floods, but the world itself will never be flooded again. It's, it's unscriptural. Remember that movie? That's probably 20 years old now, Waterworld. 
Remember that with Kevin Costner? Now, good movie, not scriptural. It's not going to happen. The Bible says, I, I put up today at school, we were doing a, a professional development on how to develop better test questions. I was like, here we go. So I did one, and I, I put up five scriptures, and I said, which of these are in the Bible? And one of them that I put up was, you know, the day will come when you can no longer tell the seasons apart. And there are people who believe that's in the Bible. It's not. It's false. It's nowhere in the scripture. In fact, here's why he told Noah. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. So that, that is not in the scripture anywhere, but that is. And then God sowed the covenant with them and told them he would never again destroy all flesh through a flood and gave the rainbow as a sign of that covenant. Now, I want to go into uh, tonight's lesson and pick up where we left off last year. That might be hard to see, but that red line, everything to the left were lifespans according to the Bible before the flood. Everything to the right is life's, our lifespans after the flood recorded in the scripture from Adam to Joseph. Now, we are mocked and ridiculed because we tell, say that that you know, Adam lived 900 and so many, I can't even read my computer, 900 and so many years. And you can see the average age before the flood of the people God chose to record in the scripture was 912 years. The average age today is 70 to 80. Something significantly happened there. And here's what I have to get in my mind, and you all, we've got to get in our mind. We either are going to believe the word of God or we're going to believe what the world says. And I want to challenge you again, just because people with a bunch of letters after their name say it doesn't make it right. This idea of millions and billions of years is a new idea. It's only been around a couple hundred years. And it's been shoved down our throats so much that we take it as fact. It's not biblical. And we're either going to choose to believe in the word of God or we're going to choose to believe in the world. Now, I'm not saying you're not going to heaven if you believe what all science says, but it sure is going to mess up your theology. In two months, Allison's going to have some letters after her name. I need everyone to, to tell her that doesn't make everything she tells me right. <laughs> so, 912 years, when God said, I will blot this out, and he says, I will destroy them with the earth, he destroyed the earth. He annihilated the creation that was here before. We use the verses in Genesis where the Bible talks about the four rivers coming out of Eden. And it does name one as the Euphrates. And we use that to say we know where the Garden of Eden is. No, we don't. Because we don't know how the topography of the earth changed after the flood. We have no idea where that was. In fact, what the Euphrates is now probably has nothing to do with what the Euphrates was in the early Genesis. Because think about it. We moved to America from England and we named cities Damascus. Lebanon. But guess what? Those are not the original ones. I don't guess there's a Hansonville in the Middle East. There might be. But you understand, they just name things again just like we do now. Now, very maybe it is the same river, but it's not in the same place. Because nothing is in the same place. And we know that even from, I, I'm not against science. I love science. And I think real, when you really study science, it lines right up with the scripture. But look at this. After the flood, everything changed. Things didn't live. People didn't live as long. That explains so much. It explains why we don't have animals as big as we did before the flood. Because reptiles keep growing as long as they live. Well, they don't live that long anymore. Just like people don't live that long anymore. So you say, well, how can someone have lived that long? I don't know. I wasn't there. I have no idea. Did they look 900 years old? I have no idea. Probably not. I know they were still having children in their four and five hundreds. So that, what does that tell me? Probably when you were 500, you looked like you were 50 now. I don't know how that works. Okay? I mean, I, I don't know. But I do know by the time they were young adults, as we would be, they were having children. So very likely, with what little information we have, you know, they probably aged very typically as we would until young adulthood, and then it was very slow. It was a slow process. And there are a lot of reasons that could have happened that we don't know. We're going to speculate. So we know that everything created in creation was created with the appearance of age. God created Adam and Eve as adults. 
We know that by the scripture. Okay, you've heard the question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, the chicken came first because God created it. I can, I'm not going to go ahead and quote all these scientists, but you can pull up well-known scientists who, who hold on to a theory that several hundred million years ago, a comet hit the earth that had some kind of amino acid on it, and that is how life first came to the earth. Where did that come from? How does that happen? That is, I, I hope I'm just preaching to the choir. How in the world can we accept that those things happened randomly? One of our science teachers pulled up a program in her biology class yesterday, and I watched it, and you know, and they were just playing around like, with, with, like if one thing happened to one of your genes, and it showed what would happen to your system, and she just took one little teeny thing around, and what it did was it would have killed whatever it was. It completely broke down their whole structure. That did, we didn't happen by a mistake. It didn't happen randomly. Things don't happen just at random. Okay, something happening at random is me flipping a coin and it landed on heads or tails. Okay, if I, what's the chances of doing that and it happening a hundred times in a row? It won't ever happen. Do you know how much more complex we are? I mean, that, it doesn't happen. We don't, no one in their right mind would expect me to go put a hunk of metal in a garage and then it randomly becoming a car. If that were possible, that's how I'd have my cars. Okay, go put a bunch of cotton and foam and see if it turns into a mattress. Believe me, I'd much rather do that after looking at how much over the weekend, how much a mattress cost. When you have to finance a mattress, that's a real problem. That's another message. That's not even church. Let's get away from that. But you, but that, yeah. <laughs> but, but you see what I'm saying? That doesn't even make sense. But we accept it and we're force fed it all the time. Everything you turn on the TV. I mean, I want to watch Elisha watch shows. We watch PBS shows that are very good. But I'm like, Elisha, that was right. That wasn't. Because I'm trying to teach him. This is the, it's either the word of God or it's not. Trees and plants are the seed. Which one came first? Read your Bible. The trees and the plants came. They produced the seed. What about the universe? Well, read the Bible. It tells you exactly when he made the stars. You know what's really fascinating? The universe is so big we can't even understand it. The, the, even begin to comprehend how big it is. But, you know, he goes through all these details of what he does on day one and day two. And then all of a sudden, oh, and he made the stars also. And then he goes on. I'm like, really? <laughs> That's how much time he spent on this planet? Jesus' first recorded miracle, that came with the appearance of age. Think of it, wine. It wasn't a process. He made wine. Wine takes time. Even if we interpret the wine as just being grape juice, that takes time. It came ready to go. He didn't tell them to bring in grapes and squeeze them and let's go grow the grapes. He turned water into something that had to have a process, into wine. The Bible is supernatural. And we just have to accept God is supernatural. And we can't explain away everything he does. We can't do that or else it's not supernatural. So we, oh gosh, I forgot I had this up here. I'm sorry. I've got my slideshow. I forgot I had this. So now let's talk about the world that was then. This, now, let me be really clear. There's a lot of ways to look at this. I'm giving you my opinion based upon what I see in Scripture, and many, not all, creation scientists will back this up, who study this a lot more than I have. But we take in the, in the creation story the Bible saying how God separated the waters below from the waters above, and that very well could just mean he created the atmosphere. But there are some people who believe there's much more than that, that God actually had this global greenhouse I'm on the wrong slide. A global greenhouse around the earth. And what would that have done? It would have, first of all, made the land more, and ha more habitable. We have ice caps that you can't live on. You've got a few penguins and polar bears, but we're not going to survive. Not for long. Not, not without, you know, our technology. We don't, we don't have cities in the North Pole. 
Okay, more abundant plant and animal life. Science backs this up with the fossil record. A more uniform temperature. We believe, as does secular science, that all land was together at one point. That is biblical. God separated the land from the waters. The waters he called seas and the dry ground he called earth. That's scriptural. Go look at your globe. It's a puzzle. I mean, if you deny, you can't deny that. That, we, we, that is pretty much undeniable if you're an atheist or if you're a Christian. Man's dominion and stewardship. We know man was given dominion over the planet. And before the fall, there would not have been T-Rexes eating people and animals tearing each other apart. Everything, they, they would have eaten what God gave them to eat. They would have been vegetarians. It was, we know the curse because of man's disobedience would have brought things upon the earth. And then we've been corrupted by sin. And then finally God wiped it out because there was nothing left but Noah that was good. So what happened at the flood when he opened the, the gates of heaven? There are people that believe he broke that canopy. Now I don't know that that's exactly what happened. But that's a theory. It explains a lot. We do know the fountains of the deep open, opening up. That's not just a, a whale bursting open. That's great earthquakes bursting open in the land, and that's continents colliding and splitting apart, causing tidal waves that we can't even imagine. I know I say a lot of the same things, but I am again. Remember about 20 years ago, gosh, that's ridiculous, it's that long ago, there was this movie called Deep Impact. And there was a giant meteor coming to the earth, and they go blow it apart in the sky to stop the one that was going to blow away earth. They couldn't stop the little one. It hits the ocean outside of Virginia Beach. And in comes the tidal wave that just wipes out entire communities. It's, I mean, it's going over mountaintops. That is scientifically accurate. That could happen today. Now, we're not going to get flooded again by the earth. But according to the book of Revelation, things like that will happen again. That's my understanding. Um, some pretty significant disasters. But when you have that happening and these continents colliding, and uh, imagine the sea floor popping open. That happens now. You have underwater earthquakes that the C4 cracks open and magma comes out. Okay, it's what causes tsunamis, underwater earthquakes. That happens all the time. So then we have the atmosphere, we have all kinds of chaos going up on it. So you can imagine everything falling apart. Well, think about what that would have done in the aftermath. No one denies there was an ice age. Secular science teaches it was 10,000 plus years ago. Creation science teaches it would have happened after the flood. Think about it. Now, again, this is speculation, but I think there's some things to back it up in the science world, so think about it. You come off the ark, the earth is, is brand new. Everything's moved around. We have no idea where things were located because that's all gone. You, you've got things split apart. Nothing remains. It's all gone. There's nothing left. What he steps out to Obviously now grass has grown back and there are trees, but it's all nature. Because cities are gone, people are gone, the animals are gone. It's only what came off that boat. But you understand after something has been in that kind of upheaval, they, scientists believe, even, even secular scientists, because there have been such an upheaval, volcanic activity would have been pretty strong. In fact, they teach that actually volcanic activity is getting less and less. Even creation scientists will teach that. It's getting less and less with time because the earth is settling more and more and more and more. We have evidence of, of volcanic eruptions. There, we, we can't deny certain things. We know of some that we've witnessed and even historical ones, but we have evidence of volcanic eruptions all around the world. And if you have cataclysmic eruptions, when Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980, the ash cloud traveled around the world three times. And in places, it went dark because the ash covered the sun. Well, what happens when the sun gets covered? The temperature drops. What happens if you have massive eruptions going across the whole earth and the sun is blotted out for a period of time? It causes an ice age. We have woolly mammoths, fully, full woolly mammoths they found frozen in ice and the ice caps. Did he choke to death on a piece of grass? Okay, something happened pretty quickly and the earth cooled off. It cooled the earth after that. And that's just a belief. And then... Small catastrophes happening after that, not global floods again. But, you know, we, we keep going. You know, water's above the firmament. 
Some people believe, again, it was a thermal blanket of invisible water vapor that would prevent strong winds and rains. Probably there was an increased carbon dioxide level that would have filtered out radiation and things like that. We have fossil evidence of ancient plants that we no longer have. And, and we can even, even secular science can, can agree with certain things, that the climate was different. Now, and I'm jumping around a lot, why do we believe the earth is young? Because we believe what the Bible says. I've had people say, well, how do we know that Adam didn't live for a million years before he sinned? Because the Bible tells me how old Adam was. It tells me how old he was when he died. So we can trace scripturally creation to Adam about 2,000 years, Abraham to Jesus about 2,000 years, Jesus to now about 2,000 years. It's about 6,000 years. It's pretty significant. Not 6 million years. Not 6 billion years. They keep making it older because they can't ever agree with anything. Here's a possibility of what the earth would have looked like before the flood. Now, this is out of a secular science book. This is out of one of your science books at school, one that I would have used. Okay, and there's, there's a lot of agreement on, on that. Do you know it's believed that the mountain range going through Ireland was once connected to where we live now? Go look at pictures of Ireland and then pull up Big Stone Gap. You can't tell them apart. It's pretty significant. But look at that. You pull them apart, and we've got a lot of the lands we have now. Look at, look at Africa, and I, I keep thinking when I move this, y'all can see it, but you can't. Africa and South America, and you know, you look at that on a modern globe, and it, it's pretty clear um, how that happened. So where did all the water go after the flood? Well, the Bible tells us. He set the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains, but at your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they took to flight. They flowed over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place you assigned them. You set a boundary that they cannot cross. Never again will they cover the earth. Why is it so hard for people to see it when he has just, he's given us everything we need to know? Here's a picture. I remember seeing this picture when I was in school. That's out of one of the science books I had. It's called From the Mountains to the Sea. And, and, and it's, it's, it's correct. There's nothing wrong with that at all. More evidence for the flood. Not that I have to convince you all. We have flood legends all over the world. There are more than 270 flood stories from the different cultures. Here's one of them. Now, if I go tell Janet something... And then she goes and tells Angela, and Angela comes and tells Chris, and he tells Tiffany, by the time it gets back to me, there's going to be some changes. So when it's not written down, when it's just passed around orally, things get changed. But look at this. This is in Hawaii. Evidence of a worldwide flood can be found in more than 270 stories and historic records found in many parts of the world. Flood legends are common in their folk tales of many other countries. Their various interpretations reflect the way details may change when stories are told from one generation to another because of the absence of written records available to them. So look at this one. So in Hawaii, long after the death of Kunahona, the first man, the world became a wicked, terrible place to live. There was one good man left. His name was Nu'u. He made a great canoe with a house on top of it and filled it with animals. The waters came up over all the earth and killed all the people. Only Nu'u and his family were saved. Sounds familiar. And that's one of about 270. We read at school, and maybe some of you all did, a story called the Epic of Gilgamesh. Guess what's in it? A great flood. And they build a boat. And some people get saved in it. One of about 270. I wonder where that came from. So, one popular theory now, even among some Christians, oh, it was a local flood. It wasn't global. Well, let's talk about why that's foolish. Number one reason, it, but by actually when I say this, I don't need to prove anymore. Um, God said I'll never flood the earth again. Well, if that was a local flood, then he lied. Because we've had thousands of floods since then. Major floods. Catastrophic floods. That's all I need to say. But I am going to talk more. That's kind of stupid if you look up on the screen. But that's what they say happened. 
If it was local, if it was local, then why did Noah build an ark? Couldn't he have just gone? Couldn't God have said, then you just go flee? Go to this land? He told Lot, you flee. I'm destroying this, but I'm not destroying that. Okay, so the, uh, the, the animals. Why did God send the animals? They could have left. The birds could have flown the coop. The animals could have ran away from it. Then, if that were, then we could have had a much smaller ark if it was just the area where they say it was. So that, that, that's all reasoning. Okay, then, then how could it rise above the tallest mountains? Okay, if we have a flood in southwest Virginia that goes above Big A Mountain, then more than Russell County is flooded. That, that's dumb. That, I mean, how, how, you, can't, you can't do that. And I love studying, but I get so frustrated reading book after book after article about people's opinions that are not scriptural. I don't have an issue with people who disagree with something that really ultimately doesn't matter to, my, to getting to heaven or something. But when it comes to just being foolish about something, I don't want to hear it. Don't, don't, tell, don't give me theology if it is anti-scriptural. Don't give that to me. It could not have been local. You can't make that biblical. You, you can make an argument scientifically or whatever you want, but you can't do it biblically. That means only the people in the vicinity would have affected. Not everyone died then. That means the Bible's wrong. And again, God would have repeatedly broken his promise never to send such a flood again. We know that the Bible teaches the flood was global. And it either happened or it didn't. It's another one of those things. Either believe it or don't. But don't try to twist it into something else. It's either what he said it is or it's not true at all. And we, we got to choose a side. As Christians, there's no more of this straddling the fence mess. We're going to be ridiculed. Be ready. But I'd be, rather be ridiculed from the truth now and face eternity with a clear conscience. Because all these people who are challenging the word of God will one day, and some of them sincerely believe, they're just wrong on some things. But you know what? We're going to give an account. He preached on that a few weeks ago. Christians are going to give an account for what we do here. That's not our salvation. Let me be really clear about that. But it is clear in the Bible. We will give an account for what we do with what he's given us here. And I would never, ever want to intentionally lead someone astray. Ever. Okay, now let's, let's bring this home. We do have an ark of salvation today. The ark was absolutely a sign of what Jesus is doing for us. God delivered the message. And he left the door open, and God was the one who closed the door, not Noah. Noah preached it. No one heard it. No one listened to it. You know Noah preached. You know. I mean, the Bible doesn't just flat out tell us what he did. But you know Noah, no, Noah didn't just sit there and hold that in himself. They had an opportunity to get on that boat, and they didn't. And God closed the door. Our door is wide open. And for this world, the door is open. But you all know... I'm preaching to the choir here. You know one day he's going to close that door. I'm so thankful to hear about Nathan because we've all worried. I mean, I know what he said. I know some of the things Rhonda said, and I, I myself talked pretty strongly to him. Like, what in the world are you waiting on? And I'm so thankful to hear that. I'm so thankful to hear that because we now know he's walked through the door before it closed on him. The door is open. It's wide open, but it won't stay open forever. Jesus said, I'm the door. If any man enter in, he'll be saved. He'll go in and out and find pasture, John 10, 9. He's the door, and he's the only door. doesn't matter. There's no truth outside of Scripture. If it can't go through the lens of Scripture, it's not true. Not popular, but it's the truth anyway. And that's another, I'm not going to go too much into that, that why are the animal fossils sorted into layers. That pretty much can be explained by the way the flood would have happened. Okay, why do we find shellfish on the bottom layer of the fossil record? Well, think about it. If the fountains of the deep burst open, it throwed them up first. They got buried first. Okay, then some of the larger animals, and then finally people, and then birds. Birds would have flown as long as they could have, and finally were taken down by the rains or fatigue. So that's, that's pretty easy to explain. And there's way more scientific explanation for that than I have the ability to. 
to explain, so I'm not even going into that a lot tonight. There's some other reasons, you know, where they lived, how intelligent they were. Uh, mobility people would have survived as long as they could. They would have found a way, even more so than some of the animals. Um, they would have, no, who knows how long they survived, probably not long. Don't think this was a gradual occurrence. I think pretty much it was a catastrophe that hit very quickly. <laughs> I don't think it took 40 days for God to kill everything. I think it probably happened very quickly. We don't know for sure. No, no one was there. Um, just a few more things as we bring this to a close. Just some more proof that that this millions of years thing is wrong. Okay, we here's one example of a low fin fish. These are fossils from a supposed 325 million year old rock. Well, there's the fish today. It still is alive. It's still very much alive. We're still finding things that they say died out hundreds of millions of years ago, that kind of thing. And again, here's something I've said before, but for 50 years, 60 years, if you went to Carlsbad, there was a sign that said it was 260 million years old. In 1988, and the main reason this changed because was because of events of Mount St. Helens. Um, they changed it to read 7 to 10, then 2, and then finally they took it away because they kept getting this proof. They just had to take it off. Oops, we're wrong. It's okay to be wrong, but that's a pretty big mistake. To be 260 million years off is a little bit of a mistake. There's Carlsbad. Mount St. Helens completely changed the way we have to think about things. They call it the most extraordinary geologic event of the 20th century. I'm going to skip through some things. One of the things that happened is they, they, it is estimated that one million trees were uprooted and thrown into what's called Spirit Lake. It completely displaced an entire lake that used to be a Boy Scout <laughs> camp. And it picked up the lake and now it's in a different place. And there are now trees petrifying, and that's only been 40 years ago, and they say it takes millions of years for this to happen. And so this leaves the evolutionists with a dilemma. Either now we, we have found evidence of fossilized trees going through the fossil record. So either these trees stood upright for millions of years while the sediment formed around them, or they somehow grew through the hundreds of feet of solid sedimentary rock looking for sunlight. We know both of those are dumb. Let me just be honest. That's for, for people who study science and have PhDs, to say that that happened is foolishness. It doesn't take that long for it to happen. And now they have things from St. Helens are proving it. There's a canyon. It's called, I think, the, they think they call it the Little Grand Canyon. That was formed in the aftermath of Mount St. Helens. Interrupted again in 1983. I think that was formed in a matter of months. Not millions of years. Not billions of years. This is out of, um, actually, the Cincinnati Enquirer. We can teach that there was a global flood on Mars, yet they deny there was ever one on the Earth. Because if they agree that there was a global flood, they have to start testifying to the authority of Scripture, which they won't accept. And if you really read what these guys have to say, some of the stuff is good. They're brilliant. They are. I'm not going to sit and say they're, everything they do is wrong. But for people that don't believe in God, they surely talk about him a lot and talk about why he can't exist. If you don't believe in something, don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. If I'm in denial about something, I'm probably not going to talk about it a whole lot. And they are in denial that God is real. They don't want to see what's in front of them. I would like to believe that, there's, that Krispy Kreme still exists in Bristol. But it's been gone 10 or 15 years now. <laughs> I, 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 can, I can say it is still there all I want. It appears that it's not there, but if you go, it's really there. The evidence says it's there. It's not. There's a gas station. One of the most ca catastrophic business decisions in recorded human history. You take away Krispy Kreme for a gas station. But do you understand what I'm saying? They will teach you, and I can quote them. I can pull it out of their own documents. They'll teach you that there's the appearance of intelligent design all through the universe. Yet they will say, but it's only the appearance. It only appears that this was designed intelligently. See this thing with four legs right here? 
Now, there is the appearance that this was built to set in. It looks like someone intentionally did that, but there's only the appearance of that. That is not really what it looks like. It's not really a chair. What really happened is over 500 million years, first um, these metals joined together in a molten state, and then it cooled down and they, they formed. And then, and then we had these acids form, and, and then cotton was formed, and somehow... It's, one of the, it's the beauty of evolution, this, this came about. No one in their right mind would agree with that, but that, that's exactly what they're saying happened to you on a much exponentially grander level. Stop believing that mess if you do. Get it out of your mind, and you teach your children it's wrong. They're going to have to learn it, and we teach it to ours in a Christian school because they've got to know what they're defending it against. We teach it, this is what you're going to be taught, so you need to know why. But you better tell your children why this is wrong. Because that it is a trick of the enemy. Because if they can get you to question creation, then you will question, and you should. If you question creation, then you better question John 3.16. I could go all night. Y'all have got to help me. And I can't go all night. Y'all don't have to read all that, but I'm going to read some. Gosh, I'm just going to read it there. Let me read a little bit here. There we go. 2 Peter 2, 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of the truth will be blasphemed. In their greed, they'll exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle. Their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, that's another message, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, who was greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over the lawless deeds that he saw and heard. If God did not do all that or if he did all that, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Wow. That's a message, but not for tonight. Okay, you know, nice famous statement. That sounds good, but it's garbage. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That settles absolutely nothing. I couldn't care less if we believe it or not. I do care. I do care if we believe it or not. I shouldn't have said that because I do. It doesn't matter what you believe. God said it and that settles it. It doesn't matter what the scientists say. It doesn't matter what Oprah says. It doesn't matter what the news anchor says. It doesn't even matter what I say. It matters what God said. Either he's right or he's wrong. It's either real or it's not. There is no in-between. There's none. We can have disagreements, and you can disagree with me tonight, and ultimately that's okay. But if God said it, it's true. Let God's word be true, and every man a liar. I'm finishing this tonight. It's going to happen. I'm on my promise. I'm on my side. Radiometric dating, who cares? Okay, so what's on the left is when they measure some things, that's what they, uh, on the right was what was measured, on the left is what was expected. Those are things that we knew. For example, some of those that are young, we know that those rocks are 38 years old. It came back 2.4 million. They threw some things from Mount St. Helens, newly formed rock that they knew was newly formed. And they, the methods we have to date was some that brought them back as hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years old when they were like months old. You can't trust that mess. You can't do it. There's more examples. Things that are 200 years old that are 0.6 million. We know that Mount Etna erupted 2,100 years ago, but it's coming back as 25 million. We know that Mount, when Mount Etna erupted. We know that from historical accounts. Those are some sources. Don't need to do that anymore. So we know we would find, if God gave us a flood, he would leave evidence. And there it is. There's your evidence. 
We have rock deposits all over the world. Fossil record all over the world. Not, not something that happened slow and gradually, but something that happened very quickly and catastrophically. We have something that occurred on a global scale, not local, and everywhere on the face of the earth we find fossils. We find similarities all across the, all across the globe. And I'm going to close finally with this, and I didn't put that up there. What does all this mean to us today? Well, I just like teaching what I believe the Bible says. I think the more knowledgeable we are, the more excited I get about the Bible, the more I want to learn, but the more we can defend our faith. And we, got, we have to be able to defend it. You know, when, well, my grandma told me this. Well, no one cares. I know that sounds harsh, but they don't. Well, the Bible says this. Well, we know that is the authority. But it's going to take more to convince some people. Why do we believe what we believe? Now, ultimately, it's a matter of faith. By faith, we believe the world was created by God. We weren't there. We, we can use the excuse, well, no one was there 500 million years ago. We're right. But neither were we there 6,000 years ago. So, yes, there is a matter of faith in it. It's called the faith. And we have to admit that. That's why it's the faith. But we believe he's left evidence for this. And God said, I have painted myself all over creation so they don't have an excuse. They are without excuse. No one will stand before God and say, I didn't know you were real. Because they do. From the, the biggest atheist in America who has a church around his house on every corner to the person in the deepest Congo who's never heard the gospel, everybody knows there's a God. Because he has revealed it to them. He has done it. There's no excuse. None. And I do want to read this because this is significant. What does this mean for us today? Matthew 24. But concerning that day and hour, we're talking about the return of the Lord. No one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away so will the coming of the son of man two men will be in the field one will be taken one will be left two women will be grinding at the mill one will be taken and one left therefore stay awake for you do not know what day your Lord is coming know this that if the master of the house had known and while part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake, would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. We don't quit and give up. We keep working until he comes. It's like we sing in Christ alone all the time at school. It's a school song. Until he returns or calls us home. We're going to keep doing it. They had the signs. They had the warnings. But they rejected them. The signs and the warnings are all around. And good grief. Before Jesus comes back. The warnings that are going to happen, all the things that are going to happen in the book of Revelation, and even the Bible goes as far as to say that just before his return, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in the heavens. I don't know what that is. The Bible doesn't tell me. Yet they'll still be called unaware because they're going to reject it, just like they did in the days of Noah. Most people are going to reject this message. But if you can save one, do it. If you can save one, do it. I don't know who said this. Maybe it was you all. But I heard this at some point, so but I'll take the credit for it tonight. Someone said they went to a beach, and there were like hundreds or thousands of starfish that had been washed up on the beach. And there was some kid or someone just picking them up and throwing them back in the water. And someone's like, you cannot help these starfish. You, cannot, you can't make a difference. But they responded back, and maybe this is just a parable. Maybe it didn't happen to say, but for that one, it did make a difference. If one person goes that it's worth whatever we do, it, it's worth it. One, Jesus left the 99 to bring in one. And finally, Luke, Luke says something very similar. Just as it was in the day of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, drinking, all that again, until the day Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, it was in the days of Lot. 
They were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planning and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let the one who's on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. And then what a striking statement. I was telling Allison, it just simply says this, remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life, his life will keep it. Don't hold on to anything on this earth because it's not worth it. I don't know if any of you have watched the, the show The Chosen. And I know not everything in it is from the Bible, but it, it, they take a lot of freedom. And this particular scene I watched is not biblical at all. It's just showing what might have happened. But there's a scene in there, and you know the story of Nicodemus who comes to Jesus by night. That's in the Bible. He's a Pharisee, but he's afraid to openly serve Jesus because he knows what the Pharisees will do to him. They'll reject him. They might even stone him. So the way they portray that in this film is Jesus has told Nicodemus, come and follow me. He's had his talk with him. And then he's in, the, in, the movie, in the movie, he's like, come and follow me. He says, on such and such a day, I'm leaving Capernaum. Do you want to go with me? Be with me that day. So Jesus meets his disciples. And they're like, he's like, he's looking at him. He's like, is everybody here? You know, Peter and all those guys. Yeah, I like it. Because they have no idea he's talked to Nicodemus. They're like, yeah, everybody's here. And, and Jesus looks down and there's a, there's a purse of money there. And Nicodemus has left it. Now, this is not in the Bible. This is on a show. Nicodemus has left it. And Jesus is like, yeah, a friend has left this for us. And he's like, yeah, you're right, everybody's here. And Nicodemus is behind the corner, listening, and he's, he's weeping uncontrollably because he knows he's too afraid to go. And Jesus just out loud says, you were so close. I don't want to be close. I don't want to be close. Close doesn't win. You know that old thing, close doesn't count? What is it except for horseshoes and grenades? So I don't want to be close. You can be close and miss it. One of the saddest scriptures in the Bible is when, when the, uh, one of the Herods, I believe, tells Paul, almost you convinced me to be a Christian. Don't hold on to anything here. Don't be Lot's wife. She turned and lost everything. She was one hand on the world and one hand on eternity. And you can't do that. You can't. There's a reason he says, I'll spew you out of my mouth. You can't hold on to both. It's this or it's that. And we get to choose. And you know what? I, I've really been convicted lately because I've been, I feel like I've become really materialistic. You know, I went about six weeks ago. And you know what? It's not that God doesn't care for us having things, but I went to Hobby Lobby to get one thing. And Allison wasn't even with me. I can't blame her. And I, and I was like, Allison, I, you know, and I spent like $200 on decorations. And I'm not saying that was a sin, but I didn't have to have that. I, I, didn't, I didn't need that. You know, I look all the time, oh, yeah, I want to expand the front porch. And I'm not saying I won't. I'm not saying all that's a sin. But I think to myself, like a, a lady from Samaritan's Purse came to talk to us today, and I'm thinking, they're thankful for a toothbrush. And if I don't have 20 gifts under the tree for Elisha, I feel like a failure. Where is that? You know, she told the story. It's 8.15. Last story. She, she had went to Tan Tanzania, and the lady there told me today, she said there was a 19-year-old a that went with him and came back, and he didn't have a shirt because he gave his shirt to a kid. That was there who he needed a shirt. He took the shirt off his own back to give him that. I did not know it was that late. Forgive me. All right, I'm going to close with that. Thank you all. I hope that that is a blessing to you.